Hello and welcome to Women of the Middle East podcast. Women of the Middle East. This podcast relates the realities of Arab women and their rich and diverse experiences. It aims to present the multiplicity of their voices and wishes to break overdue cultural stereotypes about women of the Middle East. My name is Amal Malki. I'm a feminist, scholar, and educator. This is Women of the Middle East podcast. This is season four, Women Voices Across Genres, where I will be speaking to women producing feminist content across different genres and outlets. These courageous voices delve into untapped areas such as women with disability, hybrid identities, intergenerational trauma, feminist narrative and activism, and much, much more. I'm your host, Amal Malki, contributing to creating a new narrative about us by us. This is Women of the Middle East podcast. Hello and welcome to Women of the Middle East podcast. I'm so happy today because we have Nisreen Haja Ahmed, whom um, I've been wanting to talk to for so long since I heard about um, um, her uh, a year ago and her amazing work. Uh, Nisreen is a lawyer, researcher, change maker who builds communities, communities of both practice and knowledge. She is transforming how social work looks like in the Arab world. Uh, Nasreen, welcome to Women of the Middle East podcast. Thank you so much for having me on board. I'm very excited and I listened to a few episodes of your podcast and I am happy to be here with you, Aman. Thank you, Nasreen. It's a pleasure. Nasreen, um, you have a really impressive bio, uh, which I didn't want to go through because I'd like to hear your own story, your own narrative. Tell us a bit about yourself. Um, so I'm a Palestinian, was born in Palestine and then moved to Jordan and grew up in Jordan. Um, in Jordan, I went to school in this uh, liberal co-ed uh, school where I belonged to the basketball team. And uh, that kind of formed my part of my personality, belonging to a team, um, going for games, traveling for competition. Uh, being very disciplined in practice, uh, training my body to uh, to follow suit, um, if I could say that. And uh, after finishing school, I went to study law. I decided to study law because uh, during those years in Jordan, we would cross the bridge to Palestine every summer to go see our family and relatives. And that journey, crossing the Israeli bridge and uh, going through the humiliation of the uh, inspections and the humiliation of the treatment, going back to your own country, but being um, questioned and prevented and um, viewing all that hardship every summer, uh, made me also want to become a lawyer. So I studied law. And I went to the uh, University of Edinburgh uh, to do my master's degree. During, which, uh, peri- during that period, my parents returned to live in uh, Palestine. So uh, I returned as well and joined the Palestinian negotiating team um, for the, peace, the so-called peace talks. Uh, I was one of the legal advisors to the negotiations. And that is another very long story of um, five years of trying hard to find justice through uh, negotiations and getting nowhere. So um, that took me perhaps to the third chapter in which I am in now. So I went back to university after being depressed with the talks and thinking, okay, negotiations doesn't um, get us justice. What does? And in uh, university, um, I met this guy, Marshall Gant, at Harvard Kennedy School. He's my professor, my mentor, my teacher, and he has a unique way, he's developed a unique way to organizing connect- collective action, organizing communities to demand their rights. And um, I got attracted to it. And, um, and once I finished my learning there, I returned and established an organization called AHEL. And uh, I'll tell you about it a little bit more later, but uh, that's 11 years ago now. And in those 11 years, we've uh, supported people and to build communities, to uh, demand their rights, to lead the change they want, 
through this methodology, I learned and evolved with Marshall. And uh, so far, we've supported 35 campaigns in the Arab world and in the North Maghreb. And uh, they've built uh, people power. They've built uh, a way to collective work, to building teams. And they achieved uh, their rights and the change they want. So, and I am a mother to a 20 year old. Uh, you spoke about how, and I sensed your disappointment in terms of what happened in the so-called, as you said, peace talks. Uh, are you still enthusiastic? Are you still optimistic? Uh, that kind of disappointment and pessimism that has been created through politics or you know emerged through politics is not rubbing on your work in <laughs> Ahel and other uh, uh, endeavors? I'm still very enthusiastic about uh, returning the power to the people for the people to organize themselves, uh, demand social and political and economic justice. And uh, 11 years, the past 11 years have, um, have been a blessing for me. I was able to be in touch and meet people from Yemen to um, Kuwait, uh, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Tunisia, Morocco. And there are so many examples that unfortunately not all of us know about. There are examples of um, working well together. They are right holders whose rights have been violated in a way or another. And they uh, find enough resources among them to, uh, to organize a, a journey, not one action, not one time, but a journey of continuous action um, to make their point, to demand their rights, and not to just uh, sit and wait for change to happen. And they become um, role models, role models to their children. I remember once in uh, Jabal Mabid here in Georgia, I was in a celebration in a center called Duwak, and this little girl gets passed from one row to the other and she sits in my lap and says, are you Nisreen Hajj Ahmed? I say, yes, who are you? And she says, I am, you know, this, per this, this name. And I say, which grade are you? And she said, I'm in grade three. I said, uh, how can I help you? She said, I heard that you help people organize themselves so that they demand their rights. I want to organize my... Uh, uh, my colleagues in grade three to demand a right from the principal so that the bathrooms are cleaner. <laughs> Can you help me? And I said, sure, I'll help you, but how do you know about this? And she said, my mother is, a, is an organizer in a campaign for reading. And the, the mothers come to her house every Saturday to plan and lead this campaign to improve reading. So that's just one story how you see a, ca a simple campaign around reading, not even demanding rights, just changing a habit, uh, can build um, a generation or an imp can leave an impact on the generation. Um, recently in Iraq, we've supported a campaign where uh, students organized themselves demanding that uh, money, scholarship, the university scholarship, be, uh, uh, be reserved for students who cannot afford uh, to pay the tuition. And this is already in the Iraqi law. The Iraqi law says that the government has to supply scholarships for university students who can't afford it, but it's not implemented. And they organize one action. They worked hard, they delayed it many times, the context in Iraq isn't easy, but then when they organized the action, a few um, days later, the Minister of uh, Education announced that they are allocating money for scholarships next year, 20, this year, 2023. That gives me a lot of hope. Um, you asked me if the negative... Um, experience I had and desperation from the Palestinian negotiation talks with with the occupation has, is still there with me. Uh, yes, it is. But uh, maybe I matured a little bit. 
I realized that um, to win big, we need to win many smaller ones on the way. I became a little bit more patient. So I see it as all connected. The little girl in Jabal al Nadif, with the youth in uh, Iraq, with the, with the woman working against child marriage in Lebanon. I see it all as one journey that builds on each other. And no longer waiting for a big bang to change the whole Arab world. Tell me more about those campaigns. What did you do for women and girls in the MENA region? And then I want to know more about how how do you connect with those um, maybe individuals or you know um, uh, sub communities on the ground? We are called Ahel, or we called ourselves Ahel, because we believe that people of the cause. Those who have a personal story with the cause, like you said, the personal is political, are the most um, equipped to demand their rights, to bring about change. And they are the most deserving. So the word Ahl is from, uh, from Quran, huwa ahl al maghfira wa huwa ahl al taqwa. And the word Ahl means different things. Huwa ahl al taqwa huwa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala akhtar istihqaqan wa taqwa deserves our piety, the most deserving. Huwa ahl al-maghfira, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God is the most capable of forgiveness. So the word ahl means most capable and most deserving. And we think that people with the cause, having a personal um, struggle, they are the best equipped to lead uh, the change, to demand their right. Now, it is maybe a little bit counterintuitive. Some people think, no, it's a burden. These women are um, oppressed or they face a lot of violations. It's not fair to ask them to stand up for themselves and to, um, to demand the change. Others should do justice to them. We don't believe that. We believe that they are the strongest despite um, the fact that they were a victim at some point. So our role is to go from victim to survivor too, but not stop there. We go from survivor to leader. I survived, um, let's say, injustice at work as a woman. Uh, I don't see myself as a, as a victim, but that's not enough. I'm going to lead other women at work with me to collectively demand our rights. And then we go even further, from leader to organizer. How can I organize collective action, not just demand for me and the three around me? How can I organize the sector of women working in this industry to change policies on um, women's rights at work? So you ask me, uh, what have you done for uh, women? Um, I answer, uh, we do with them. We make sure that uh, we support them. They lead and we support. They hear about us from another campaign. So we work with a group of women in Al Biqa in Lebanon. Uh, they are women who were wed as children. They were wed very young. They're older now. And they heard about us, the Women Now Center heard about us from our work with another campaign called Families for Freedom also a campaign led by Syrian women. So we, ha we supported that campaign. It advanced this campaign. This group of women heard about us and the Women Now uh, organization. And they approached us saying, can you work with us to build a campaign against child marriage in al biqar in southern Lebanon? Also in Palestine, um, we work with the Palestinian Druze to refuse the obligatory army service in the, in the occupation of the army. And uh, they heard about us from another group, Bedouin group, who we were accompanying in Naqab, in, in Negev, to uh, resist uh, a draft law that will confiscate their land. Uh, so there's this way, where um, someone is inspired by a campaign they heard about and um, reach out to us. The second way is that uh, we take note of uh, a huge, a grave violation that is happening. 
and we go look for the leaders ourselves. So a few years ago, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, has completed a study on injustice that uh, te female teachers face in private schools in Jordan. Uh, the ILO approached us and they, we said to the ILO, we don't work with um, any NGO or organization. We have to work with the people of the cause themselves, and they're cutting you the right holder. Uh, so can you bring those to us? And they said, we don't know where they are. Let's go together and find them. So we started going to um, the union, the teachers union, to house meetings, running one-on-ones with individual teachers. And then we found a group of uh, teachers who, um, who were ready to lead, to lead this campaign. And they were ready to lead that campaign because each one of them had a story with injustice. So just like you with me, you started with my story, we always start with stories, which is also a very feminist thing to do. And from there we move on to uh, a journey of accompanying. So we accompanied the woman in Bukhah to stop child marriage there. We accompanied the women uh, who are teachers in private schools to uh, stop injustice at labor in their labor rights in private schools in Georgia. Amazing. So most of your work is uh, actually uh, on the ground. Uh, how did COVID affect um, the work in Ahel? And have you managed to transfer those campaigns into digital campaigns? And if you have, did it work? Yeah. So Ahel um, is now a team of 15 uh, amazing people. And um, they're also a source of uh, huge hope for me um, and maybe for each other. Uh, the first thing during COVID was how do we stay as a strong team? How do we nurture ourselves and take care of our, our, our own motivation? So like many of, of us around the world, we went online. But we had the uh, rituals rituals to be connected, rituals to read and learn together. We started reflecting on these Sufi stories and Juha stories to keep the, the morale, but also to stay connected. We would open every day with, with each other, half an hour coffee and close the week together, celebrating our achievements and constant learning um, and growth. Um, and our team is like divided into three units. Uh, the coaching campaigns unit and they're in charge of accompanying leaders and women uh, in their campaign and, and introducing them to the methodology Marshall Gantt and, uh, and uh, we, the one we developed and um, and then the second unit is teaching and learning and in it there's a, a beautiful team that uh, teaches organizing in workshops and in online courses and in offline courses and then the third one is Athar Network. Athar Network is a network of leaders in the Arab world who are using our methodology community organizing in building power. And they also produce a beautiful podcast. I hope you can hear it. It's called Athar. Every episode is a story of a campaign and a group of leaders from the ground. So how do you continue that in COVID? The campaigns, of course, went offline. And now coaching became on Zoom most of the time. But a lot of the infringements and the violations did not stop because the COVID stopped the work. So the teachers are now working hard to protect their rights because their rights are now even more violated during uh, COVID. So we were helping them organize online. Uh, what about our learning? Uh, how do we continue our teaching program? Now, we're lucky because four years ago, we started teaching um, a course online. It starts in February and ends in June. And it has 100 students from the Arab world. Each one of them has a campaign and is leading collective effort for their rights. So we were lucky that continued because it's anyway online. It was also a blessing that the uh, application rate to the online course rocketed. We had this year, for example, we have 570 applications for 100 seats. So we started doing more online workshops, 
orientation sessions, webinars, and we were skilled at it because we had started it earlier on. And that was amazing to uh, support people, stay together, build a community. Um, we worked with a group in, uh, in Lid, in Palestine, um, who uh, organized themselves during that period to, um, to give support to the elderly in the community. I'll tell you this story, how I got to know about you. I wanted to establish a kind of a social innovation lab um, based on a commitment of social justice and gender equality. Um, so I looked at different models really around the world. And then I got to Marshall Gang's um, program um, and I even contacted him. Um, and at the same time, a friend of mine had heard about you and your work, who is a Palestinian as well in the United States. And she said, oh, wow, but, you know, Nasreen Hajj Ahmed actually took that program. And the m amazing thing that she has done is she took it and she localized it. And I said, okay, so now here is a woman who went into this program knowing exactly what she wanted. Tell me more about even the knowledge and the knowledge transfer that comes out of this program. In the beginning, when I said, okay, I'm gonna come back to Jordan and try this methodology I, I learned at Harvard. And you know, Harvard is like a big institution, but at the end, does it work here? Does it fit here? And, um, and we started, there are five practices to organizing. I'll tell you quickly. The first one is how you, Amman, for example, want to find your leadership team to bring about the change you want to build. And how do you use stories for that? So that's practice one, public narrative. And the second one is how do you build relations to nurture commitment? Many people ask us, like, how do I keep people committed? How do I keep people motivated? And yes, they are motivated to the cause. They are motivated to their own story, but there's also something we can do together in our relationship to motivate and protect commitment. How do we do it? So that's the second practice. The third practice is building a team. So I find people with the public narrative. I do my own definition of self with my story. I help others define themselves as leaders. How do we work as a team? And, and that's a whole area of study and it's so important. And one team is not enough, just like in feminist theory. Power needs to be shared, leadership needs to be shared. So to claim that I am a, a feminist and I have one team, that's not right. Let's have multiple teams, let's build the whole community, our own community of, um, of right holders in multiple teams, whether in my neighborhood, in my university, in my country, across the Arab world. How do we build and keep multiple teams of leaders? And they're leaders, they're not followers. So that's practice number three. And practice number four, how do I set a strategy? An objective for the change I want? Um, a theory of change that is uh, based in power analysis. Why power analysis? Again, feminist principles, because we need to change who has power who doesn't have power. And not just change, stop child marriage. It's important to stop child marriage, but how do we stop child marriage with a strategy that changes the power structure in the community? So that's practice um, four. And the last practice is action. How do we design action and tactics and peaks and events that uh, keep people motivated, that bring us more people to the campaign, to the movement? And there are like ways to do that. Um, so I took these uh, practices and came here and started saying, okay, how do you do storytelling in the Arab world? It's not the same as they do it in the US or in Europe. You can't walk up to someone and say, hey, what's your story? They'll think you're weird. Like, who are you? So we, we adapt that. People are used to telling stories of self, their, their personal story. It's harder to tell the story of the collective, like what's the story of women in, in, um, in Qatar as a collective? How, how did this story evolve over the past five years? 
Who, who even tells the story of women? Like you were saying earlier, it takes generations. It's true, it takes generations. But I think that we have succeeded in the past 10 years as women rights uh, defenders, as feminists. The change that has happened in the past 10 years in the Arab world on women rights is amazing. It's phenomenal. But someone needs to tell that story. So how do we tell our own story, our community story? And how do we decipher now, like what's the story now uh, with regards to women rights, with regards to child marriage and so forth? How do we call to action? So I started and then later with my, my team and every day actually with the team, how do we adapt this even further to our own culture? When we nurture relationships, they practice too. We host house meetings, like this Saturday I'm hosting a house meeting for a group of women in Jordan to come in support of a campaign, a campaign uh, against femicide, against murder of uh, women. How do we hold that house meeting that it is really in line with our culture? It's not alien. Um, so anyway, to cut it short, that is the bulk of the work, but it's a beautiful experience to make it our own, to bring our culture into it. We document it. On our website, you'll find the organizing notes from Marshall Gans translated, but you'll also find um, a station called the House Station, Mahatta Chais, how to build leadership, how to build teams. There are articles and reflections written there. Um, there's our manual with the five practices available for whoever wants to read it in Arabic with anecdotes from our experience. And there's the Athar podcast, a story every, every time. Last uh, episode was uh, a campaign in Kuwait called Nasser Bek. Uh, it's a beautiful one. So you get to see a different reality in the Arab world, in our own language and in our own experience. Do you uh, involve men, or well, basically men, who are decision makers in our societies? Do you involve them when it comes to campaigns about women? Uh, so the campaigns we have supported and the graduates of our online course, they're both uh, led by men and women. Sometimes the topics are for women rights and sometimes not. Uh, like refusing the army service in Palestine. Uh, in occupied Palestine to, to join the occupation army, campaign targets young men because they are the ones who are um, obliged to join the army. So it's not for women's rights, but it is a very much a feminist campaign. It's a feminist campaign because it addresses injustice. It's a feminist campaign because there are women leading it as well, although they're not obliged to, um, to serve the army themselves. But it's their brother, it's their, um, their uncle, their, you know. Ahel does uh, support all kinds of campaigns, and for us, all campaigns that support social justice and uh, help marginalized communities is a feminist uh, campaign. Now, with regards to campaigns that demand women's rights, and they are led by women as well. Uh, yes, we engage the we engage men. They engage men without giving men the driver's seat. So, uh, Latka Bruna campaign against child marriage. They built uh, 12 teams, 12 leadership teams, and last year they broke 150 engagements. These teams, they have some men in them. They they. Uh, ask men to support in talking to the father, but the, the father who would break the engagement of his daughter or help her break the engagement. There are men that are supporting in tactics. There are men that are members in the leadership team, but the leadership is for the woman. They go to um, Dar al-Ifta, to uh, the judges. They go to the sheikhs who write the, the contract. They talk to them, they share their stories, how this leads to injustice. And that's why the, even the power dynamic in the family, with the husband, with the son, with the mother-in-law, that also shifts. Last month we had the convening of 18 campaigns here in the Dead Sea, in Jordan. And I, we were listening, they were sharing the learning they had with each other and the tactics that work and how they stay committed and motivated. And one woman said, 
that he was out in the neighborhood collecting a signature on a petition. Uh, she and her campaign were leaving. And her son came back home saying that uh, my friend in the street told me that your mom is uh, leading a campaign and she's collecting petitions. And his mom said, yes, indeed, that's what we're doing. And he said, I'm very proud of you. She was moved. Lovely, of course. These things matter, you know, in the dynamics in the family. Of course, of course. I mean, it starts. It all starts with the family. Who are the funders of such campaigns? Uh, who cares that much about those many communities here and there? So here are two answers. Answer number one is that also in line with feminist principles, we are all resourceful. We have a lot of resources. We are rich. Regardless of what made us think that we are lacking, I mean, yeah, there is economic injustice, I'm not denying that, but there are resources. So when we coach a campaign, we always start with, let's take stock of our resources. We have, if you have 18 people in the room, you have 18 homes, you have 18 rooftops, you probably have uh, all these uh, bodies and feet. We have creativity, we have love, we have singing, we have the acting, we have uh, cooking, we have, we have so many things, if we are a community. So first answer is, we have to confirm first and take stock of the resources we have. And once we do, you realize that you don't need much for a campaign. Like the child marriage, the anti-child marriage campaign in, uh, in Lebanon. The women who were married as children, they used to go visit the next door and to share her story and the impact of child marriage on her with the mother, with the little, with the teenager there. Even transportation, not that much when you're working in a, in a community and you have multiple teams. You have a team for every neighborhood. Maybe sometimes you need communication, uh, cards, or a little bit for transportation. When you have a demonstration, maybe you need to print a banner, but it's nicer if you throw it. So once you shift your thinking about what are the resources you need when you talk about a, a, a campaign on the ground, the missing resources are not much. Campaign we worked with in the past against what's so-called honor crime. They sold bracelets, they sold t-shirts, they sold mugs. Um, they found the print houses and they convinced them of the campaign the printing shops joined them, so they printed that for them pro bono. Uh, another campaign made a small fund of interested men and women, like you and me, and we put uh, 100 JDs there, 200 JDs, 200 dollars there, and that made a small fund that they throw on. So that's the second answer, and the last answer is our fees, a hen's fees. So I told you about the campaign uh, called Qum uh, Ma'al Mu'allam, Stand Up with the Teachers for Women Teachers' Rights in Jordan. The ILO covered our fees. So we didn't ask the teachers to pay our, our, our fees. The ILO uh, contracted us, they paid our fees. Um, the Lat Bruna campaign, Child Marriage, Women Now, the center, the organization supporting them, they contracted us, they paid our fees. So we try to find the best partner, a value-based partner, to come in and support the campaign because they care for the cause. So that's the third answer. Yeah, love it. We are surrounded as women and the women we work with, they're surrounded by a discourse that is discouraging, that is undermining, that, that wants to convince her that she will fail. Although there are so many examples these examples are not mainstream. I tried in this podcast to, to share as many stories and examples to change that discourse. Unfortunately, when we work with a campaign led by women and men, the same actually, uh, people, sometimes their relatives, their colleagues, their friends, they say like, oh, you think that you will be able to change that reality? It's bigger than you. Or, oh, shouldn't you focus on earning a living? Shouldn't you focus on the uh, upbringing of your children? What this um, political space is not uh, good for you. You may be requested for summons for questioning. So all this discourse, who is paying you? Is this a foreign agenda? Is this against religion? Like everything to disempower. And that narrative exists. 
And we, um, and you and I, and thank you for this podcast, we need to change that narrative. There are stories of success. There is a campaign we accompanied called IBNI in Jordan, Parents of People with Disability. They want the government to change the way the clinics, public clinics work and give them more uh, services, especially vocational. They succeeded. They worked for a year during COVID. It wasn't easy. It's not like, oh, poor them, people with disability, let's give them all right. That's not how it works. They worked really hard. The Minister of Health refused, refused to see them in the beginning. They sent him a thousand messages on WhatsApp, each one with her story saying, we need to see you. He saw them. They collected 12,000 petition signatures. That happened. We should stop saying that it is impossible. So I feel the first hurdle is each one around us, that it should not be acceptable for someone to tell anyone, you cannot, it is not possible, the political picture is hard, what agenda do you carry, you know? And instead say, yes, there are examples, they're recorded on other podcasts, you, read, you hear them in your podcast as well. So we need to change that discourse, that's the first hur hurdle. And the second hurdle, I think, is the tightening of uh, political space. Now, in each one of the Arab countries, there's the electronic crime law. You worry uh, to write your opinions uh, openly against normalization, for example. You worry uh, writing your opinion against arrest, illegal administrative detention, because there is this electronic crime law. Whereas you would think there that the role would be to protect us, mm -hmm. right? We are um, harassed online. Um, the, uh, the harassment we face online actually can be rendered and, and transferred into the physical, you know, sphere as well. Uh, and you would think that this is their role to protect us, uh, women. Uh, instead, what they do is, as you said, um, unfortunately, the spaces of freedom, uh, the freedom of speech in the Arab world have really shrunk. Exactly. And what do we do in this situation? That's the question. The hurdle is, as you rightly said, um, freedom of expression, freedom of organizing and freedom of um, associations, unions, associations have decreased and they're decreasing. What do we do? Do we say, let's give up? Let the media handle the war. Do we say, uh, let public opinion leaders and influencers call for, their, for our rights? Uh, let Amnesty International Human Rights Watch raise it? Or do we say, okay, what are the pathways, the avenues that we can act given this restriction? Because acting in on its own is resilience, is resistance. What other tactics, how can we protect ourselves what digital security do we need to learn are there lawyers on call to help us and here i think comes the the last point i'll make um, yes we are hopeful and yes we are uh, romantic and dreamy nothing wrong with that we are also realistic and realistic means that in this current culture and narrative this current restriction on freedom of expression it will probably take us four or five attempts to achieve the change we want. To think that we will do a demonstration or um, a call to action and the world should change and the decision maker should change his mind and people should stop fringing or violating labor rights, in my opinion, is naive, given the context. So anyone we work with, we say, this is gonna take you six, seven attempts. How will you be resilient? How will you go on? You're not going to win from the first go, not the second go. Maybe in a different country, maybe in Iceland, maybe in Norway. In this part of the world, it's going to take you four or five attempts. What do you need to do? And you know, the, the answer is at the, at the heart of what you and I believe, which is we build other people's leadership for, for, for us to continue, for new generations of leaders. And we build multiple teams in our campaign because if one team is tired, one team is um, uh, it dismantled, then there are other teams that will continue the, the carrying of the torch. And we change the discourse that it will take more than one attempt and we know that and we're willing to keep going until we win. And we will be creative. 
So I think that's the reframing of the uh, success mentality and the discourse of what gets us there. Yes, and never give up. Um, I love it. It takes several attempts, four, five, six, seven, no one knows to build your resilience and you have to be resilient, not just to achieve what you wanted to achieve, but also to pass it on. Um, and this is exactly what you have done, Nisreen. Um, I can't tell you how grateful I am for your work and what you are doing um, for all of us. You have that heart of a leader. Uh, thank you for doing this for all of us, all women, all feminists, men and women who believe in social justice, uh, um, and our ability, and our ability to be uh, the agents of our own stories. Thank you so much, Aman. Beautiful words to uh, end our conversation. I love it. I hope we'll meet uh, Thank you, again. Thank you, Nisreen. It's a pleasure, really, really a pleasure. Or in Jordan or in Qatar or wherever um, you will be. I'd love to introduce you to um, my team. Thank you for listening and watching. To stay up to date with Women of the Middle East podcast, you can subscribe and don't forget to rate us. If you would like to contact me directly, you can do so on Instagram or Twitter or via email. This is Women of the Middle East podcast.